So today, um, what we are starting is we're starting the last bit of chapter seven. So today we're basically trying to analyze the factors that influence a person's ability to remember information. So we're looking at two types of cues, uh, context and state dependent cues. We're looking at the use of maintenance versus elaborative rehearsal. And we are looking at the serial position effect. Um, so these are the three kind of main topics or four kind of main topics that we're looking at today. And by the end of today, hopefully you'll be able to distinguish between context and state dependent cues with one example for each. Um, you should be able to explain the role of maintenance rehearsal and the role of elaborative rehearsal in terms of how each of them allow you to encode or store information into your long term memory. You should be able to describe what the serial position effect is. And you should be able to explain the two effects that come out of that, which are the primary and recency effect with reference to names of memory stores, like short term memory and long term memory. Okay, so that's basically what today is going to look like. So let's just go ahead and get started with the first topic, which is context dependent and state dependent cues. Now, this is a really, really, really easy topic. Um, it's just basically looking at two types of retrieval cues. So you might remember that whenever I talk about retrieval cues, we say that the word cues kind of rhymes with the word clue. So uh, any kind of retrieval cue, whether it's context dependent or state dependent, is intended to help you or act as a kind of hint to help you remember some kind of information that you've learned or some kind of experience that you've gone through. Okay, so a retrieval cue is any kind of hint or kind of um, clue that will help you to remember the information that you've learned, okay? And so today we're learning about two of these types of kind of retrieval cues. One is called context dependent, the other is state dependent. So context dependent is talking about how the places that you've learned information can help you to remember the information that you learned in that particular place. So context is all about the external environment. It could be a room that you learned your information in. It could be a place where you experienced a memory or experienced something. Um, it could be a place where you saw something happening, like a crime scene, okay? So a lot of the time um, when eyewitnesses are at a crime scene or they see an accident, often remember we talked about how police will take them back to the crime scene because that will help to jog their memory. So that's an example of a context-dependent cue. This other picture underneath the crime scene image is a picture of um, an Indigenous leader kind of telling some stories from the dream time. And so a lot of these Indigenous leaders when they want to tell stories about the dream time or tell stories from their childhood, they often find it better to go to the actual place where they, um, where a story might have happened or go to a particular place where they experience the memory as a child. And that helps to jog um, their memory of, you know, what actually happened at that point, okay? Because things in their environment, like a tree or a building, help them remember certain uh, parts of that memory. For you guys, um, what's more relevant is, um, for example, studying in your room, okay? When you study in your room, if I were to come to your house and give you the sack to do in your room, you would often do better on that sack as compared to when you do it in a random classroom, okay? Similarly, um, one of the main reasons why VCA strictly have this policy that all VCA exams must never be done in the same classroom where the subject was taught. Why they have that policy is because a lot of the time when you do um, an exam in the same classroom where you were taught the subject, there are context dependent cues within the environment. So you might look at the board and remember your teacher drawing a diagram on that part of the board, or you might look at um, the clock and you might remember some kind of information. It's really strange, but there are context dependent cues that can help you in that way. And you might not even be consciously aware of them to begin with. Okay, so that's why obviously VCA exams are always held in like multi-purpose halls or gyms or other buildings that are not places where uh, the content was studied um, on a daily basis. Okay, so obviously that's what a context dependent cue is. It's a cue that relates to your location or the physical environment, okay? It's external, so a context dependent cue is never related to the person, it's related to the surroundings where they learned something or the environment in which they experienced something or witnessed something. So I put a little arrow here to a study. This study is not actually in the study design, but it's another good example um, of how um, context dependent cues can help um, memory of information. It's one of the experimental findings. It's all over every psych textbook. So I think it's kind of important for us to at least uh, skim over it a bit. 
So the study was conducted by Godin and Baddeley. Now Baddeley was a guy who um, you might come across in other places because he was kind of the guy who coined the term working memory. So he was the guy who came up with the concept of working memory. So obviously he was further interested in memory and he wanted to kind of, um, he wanted to kind of create this experiment where he wanted to see if the location or the place that you've learned something helps you to then remember information you learned in that place better than, um, you know, the other situation. So what he did was he took um, a bunch of divers and then he made those divers learn a list of words on land. And then he made them learn the, that list of words um, underwater. And what he found was that when you've learned the list of words underwater, and then you then have to recall them underwater, um, you're going to have better recall as compared to learning the words underwater and then recalling them on land. So essentially what he was trying to say was that um, if you can try to recall information or test a person on their knowledge of information in the same place that they learned that information, they will have better memory of the content they, will have, they had learned. Okay, so that's basically Godin and Baddeley's study um, in a very summarized way. Okay, so context dependent is all about the place or the external environment where you learnt information. Um, the next thing that we're looking at is state dependent. So state dependent is more about the internal environment. This is more related to the actual person, okay, rather than the outside world. So state dependent is referring to the internal environment of what's happening inside a person. A lot of the time, most examples will make reference to emotional states, that it's about the emotional environment. But the reason I put a little picture of this um, kind of guy drinking beer, kind of passed out a little bit drunk there, is because um, state dependent cues are not only about your emotions, but they can also be about any state of consciousness. So um, if you're drunk and you're in an alcohol induced state, that is an example of an um, internal environment. If you're under the influence of some kind of drug, that is an example of a um, state dependent you know, cue um, or an internal environment. If you're under the influence of some kind of, you know, um, anesthetic or some kind of uh, medical kind of drug, um, you know, that is also another example of an internal environment because it changes the way you experience your consciousness, okay? So in a very basic example, information that's learned when you're in a happy state might only be able to retrieve, uh, might only be able to be retrieved when you're also happy. Uh, similarly, information that you learn or memories that you recall when you're in a sad state might only be able to be recalled when you are in the same sad state. It's kind of like that concept where uh, people tend to remember more of the sad things that have happened to them in the past when they are sad. Okay. If I'm happy, I'm not really consciously recalling the sad memories of my life. Okay. So in order for me to recall the sad memories of my life, I need to be in a sad emotional state, okay? I need to have that sad internal environment. Similarly, um, sometimes the, you might have seen in some movies or some TV shows, sometimes people when they're drunk or when they're in an alcohol-induced state, they might remember certain memories that never come to their head or never come to their memory while they're in a conscious kind of so, uh, sober state. So obviously, um, sometimes there are memories that you recall better, if you had formed that memory while you were drunk or while you were in a drug induced state. Okay. It's why when people are, you might've seen videos where people are kind of like, um, you know, half conscious after a surgery and they start blabbering like random things. And after they gain consciousness and they're asked about what they were, you know, discussing or what they were rambling on about, they're like, what, what are you talking about? I don't remember that ever happening. So again, you have to be in the same internal environment to recall that certain information as well. Uh, okay, so that's basically context and state dependence. So context is all about the external physical environment, um, any physical environmental cues, and state dependent is all about the internal environment, which is more about your emotional states and any other state of consciousness, okay? So that's basically the difference between the two. Uh, any questions about this specific topic? No? Um, no. Cool. Okay, so just as long as you know what to differentiate, how to differentiate between the two, and you know one example for each, um, then you should be all good with that. Alrighty, then we'll move on to the next um, slide. So the next slide is looking at, um, we're going to be looking at two types of rehearsal today. Rehearsal is just a method that people use to keep information in their memory or to move information into long-term memory. 
Um, so the first type of rehearsal we're looking at is called maintenance rehearsal. Maintenance rehearsal, I would have talked about this before when we did the Atkins and Schifrin model in chapter, um, in chapter six, but maintenance rehearsal is basically repeating information again and again and again and again in order to maintain that information within short-term memory and with the hope that it will get into your long-term memory. Now, another word for maintenance rehearsal is rote learning. Um, I often refer to it as blindly memorizing in class. Okay, so a lot of the time when you're just repeating a uh, definition to yourself over and over again without really looking at the meaning of that definition, without looking at the key terms, you're just kind of repeating it constantly to yourself in the hope that it will get into your head and you will memorize it. That is maintenance rehearsal, okay? Um, maintenance rehearsal is good for some things because it can help to increase the limited duration of short-term memory. So I might have, you might have remembered I gave you guys that, that example where if somebody has, um, is giving you their phone number or if somebody is giving you a list of numbers that are important to memorize, um, our short-term memory can only hold a maximum capacity of nine items, okay? You can't hold more than nine items. If you look at most uh, mobile phone numbers, they kind of exceed um, nine numbers, right? So what generally happens with maintenance rehearsal is that we can actually repeat that information over and over and over again to actually exceed or to maximize that limited um, duration and capacity of short-term memory. So rather than short-term memory just being kind of 30 seconds, we can make short-term memory into like a minute or two minutes. Because every time we repeat that number again in our head, we are refreshing our short-term memory. It starts from zero seconds again. Okay, so that's what maintenance rehearsal is about. It's all about just repeating information again and again to yourself in order to maintain it within short-term memory so that we can overcome that limited 30 second duration of short-term memory. So now the question is, can you use rote learning? Can you use this blind form of memorization, this constant repetitive um, repeating that information to yourself again and again? Can you use maintenance rehearsal essentially to um, actually remember information in the long term? Well, the answer is yes, information can actually go into your long term memory if you use maintenance rehearsal. The only problem is it won't stay there for very long. So you're very likely to forget it. And the reason is you haven't understood the fundamental kind of uh, significance of that information, or you haven't understood the fundamental meaning of that information. And if you've got information in your long term memory that doesn't have meaning, your brain doesn't really uh, see the sense of it and it just kind of eventually decays, okay? So decays means that it um, eventually kind of fades away from your memory. So you might forget certain parts of it. You might still remember maybe one or two bits of it, but the main kind of gist or the main parts of it are forgotten or decayed. Um, so that's what maintenance rehearsal is about, repeating information over and over again um, in order to maintain, that's where the word maintenance comes from, maintain that information in short-term memory. So we don't give a meaning to the information? Yes, in most cases in maintenance rehearsal, we're not giving meaning to information. Yeah. It's just yeah. repeating. So that's what this comic kind of says. He just memorizes the year 1620, but he doesn't understand the significance of that. And he says he'll probably forget it forever after that test. Okay, this is how a lot of um, students kind of study, especially in the early years, like year seven, eight, nine, it's all about like memorizing content. So if you ever go to any year seven or eight class, um, you'll see them just like reading through their revision notes, constantly like, you know, repeating that information or repeating a definition again and again. But if you really ask them a question on it, they might not be able to actually answer it. Okay? Yes, but doesn't that only last for like 30 seconds? Um, it can last for, it, it's supposed to only last for 30 seconds, but if you repeat it enough, to that kind of level that you've repeated it so many times, it can actually move to long-term memory as well. So that's what we said, that if you're actually repeating a certain definition so many times to the point that it's actually almost like memorized, it will actually get into your long-term memory. But it won't stay there for a very long or permanent time. Okay, so to give you an example, the uh, definition of lock and key process um, that we did in chapter three, I mean, sorry, chapter two, um, if you had blindly memorized that or if you had used maintenance rehearsal to basically um, try to remember that particular definition, 
by the time the mid-year exam comes around or by the time this uh, final uh, year exam comes around, you will barely remember any of that definition because you didn't understand the actual meaning behind the definition. You were just blindly memorizing what the definition was. So that's what maintenance rehearsal is. Okay, so yep. um, maintenance rehearsal is the first form of rehearsal we're going through. Elaborative rehearsal is the better form of rehearsal, okay? So if you wanna choose between maintenance or elaborative in terms of studying for your exam or studying for any subject, you'd always wanna choose elaborative. The reason for that is in elaborative rehearsal, we're not just blindly memorizing information, but we are elaborating on that information. Elaborating means that we're really looking deep into it. We're really um, expanding that information. You know, when I tell you to elaborate something in a sack, I'm always like, give me more details, give me more information, talk about the deeper meaning of this concept. So elaborative rehearsal is a type of uh, way of putting information into your long-term memory that involves a deeper kind of um, examination of the content and basically involves you elaborating the content. Elaborating means you're looking at the significance or the deeper meaning of that information. So how do we look at the deeper meaning of information or how can we actually, um, you know, apply elaborative rehearsal in our own like study and stuff like that. So basically elaborative rehearsal can be applied by um, taking new information that you learn and applying that to previously stored or previously um, kind of encoded information that's already in your long-term memory. So you might remember a lot of the time in most of your subjects, um, if you've already learned a topic in unit, uh, unit three or unit two or unit one, um, your teachers will often say, okay, well, we've already learned about this in unit, um, in chapter one. So now we're just kind of expanding upon it again. And they try to make links between the new content and the content that you already learned. So um, we kind of did this when we learned about, um, you know, glutamate. We learned about glutamate again as an important neurotransmitter um, involved in synaptic plasticity. And we already had previously learned about it with reference to, um, you know, the lock and key process with reference to it being an excitatory neurotransmitter. So it's taking new information and rather than looking at that information and starting from scratch, we're linking the new information we're learning to information that has already been learned before. Okay. And by doing that, we're actually tapping into what we already know rather than starting from square one. And elaborative rehearsal is used so much, a lot of the time you won't even realize it, but a lot of the time when we ask you to come up with a real life example. So when I say, okay guys, I want you to create a real life example or a real memory and then apply encoding storage and retrieval processes to that memory. That kind of an activity is an example of elaborative rehearsal because by asking you guys to come up with a real life example, I'm getting you to not just memorize that definition word to word, but take that concept and apply it to your real world and apply it to the real, um, to real life. Okay, so that's what elaborative rehearsal is about. It's all about linking information you already know, um, sorry, linking information that's new or that's just come to your knowledge to information you already know that's stored in your long-term memory or to information that you already see happening in the real world or in real life. Um, so that's what elaborative rehearsal is about. So obviously, why would we use elaborative rehearsal? Because elaborative rehearsal involves a deeper level of encoding. Remember we talked about encoding or processing of information based on meaning, based on semantic encoding. So elaborative rehearsal uses semantic encoding or processing information based on meaning, whereas maintenance rehearsal uses more kind of visual or sound-based encoding, which is obviously weaker in terms of getting information into your long-term memory for a longer period of time. So when we store information into our LTM using elaborative rehearsal, number one, it makes sure that that information is stored for a longer period of time. And number two, we're very likely to, we're very unlikely to forget that information because we've understood the fundamental deeper meaning of that information and how it links to the real world. So um, another example here um, that, some people might use in their real life. So if you've meet, met someone for the first time and they say, my name's Kim, you might try to make a link between how that person looks and the name Kim. So you can remember that name a little bit better. So if that person is wearing cargo pants or is kind of has red hair, you might kind of um, match the image of them in your head to the image of Kim Possible. And you might be like, okay, well, Kim Possible has red hair. So, oh yeah, her name's Kim. 
or if um, she's a little bit like, you know, she's wearing kind of high end fashion brands or she's a brunette, um, you know, you might kind of link her to Kim Kardashian. Okay. Um, or, you know, Kim Jong-un. So you can kind of like link it to any kind of thing that you see in the real world. So the new information in this example is Kim, which is the name and how you're linking it to information in the real world or existing information in your memory is by linking it to other examples of Kim's that are already stored in your long-term memory that you know from seeing in the real world or from seeing in, um, uh, in kind of like popular media or popular culture. Okay, so that's basically elaborative rehearsal. Another example for you then. The last example for elaborative rehearsal on this slide is just taken from um, the Oxford textbook. So um, again, there was a study conducted by Craig and Lockhart. And what they did was they gave some participants um, a few words to memorize. So gate, yacht, uh, truck and apple. And so what they found was that participants who used elaborative rehearsal were 80% we're likely to recall 80% or more of the words compared to participants who use visual encoding. So if you're going to go ahead and blindly memorize these four words, just saying, okay, gate, yacht, truck, apple, gate, yacht, truck, apple, and just continuing that way for like five minutes. Yes, you are going to be using maintenance rehearsal there, but you're not making meaning of those particular words there and you're likely to forget them very quickly. However, by you, um, if you're going to use elaborative rehearsal to memorize these four words, what you might do is you might use each of these words in a sentence, or even better, you might make a story out of them. So um, you might say, for example, um, let's see. So the girl, the girl um, left her house and opened the gate. She was walking towards the harbor where her yacht was um, anchored. Um, on the way to the harbor, she saw a truck where her best friend um, was going to the other side of town. Um, when she got into the yacht, she felt a bit hungry, but was lucky to have an apple in her bag. So what you're doing is you're kind of placing those four words into a kind of story or a narrative. And by doing that, you're actually making meaning of each of those four words, okay? A more simpler version of these tasks, which you might have seen with a lot of primary school kids, is the teacher will introduce a new word. Like, okay, kids, today's new word is apple. And then the kids will be like, oh, okay, Apple, yeah, miss, we know the word. And then the teacher will be like, uh, no, you don't. Let, let me, um, you know, prove to me that you know the word. Uh, use it in a sentence. So then each kid will write a sentence with the word Apple in it. And obviously, if they don't know what Apple means, and if they write something stupid like, um, I don't know, I don't even know, like, I am an Apple or something like that, um, then obviously they don't understand what the word apple means but if they write a coherent sentence like i ate an apple for breakfast then the teacher will know that yes they've actually understood what it means and they haven't just blindly memorized the word okay so that's basically what um elaborative rehearsal is yes about. yes um can you also like use learning techniques as forming like images in your head to remember yes stuff? that is another really good example of elaborative rehearsal so forming images in your head so sometimes people there's actually a video on the uh week three tile on your class page, um, which I've just linked from YouTube, um, that shows you an example of like an, an elaborative rehearsal technique that someone uses to remember some information. And that involves like visualizing something in your head as well. Yeah. Um, also when we talk about like all these memory tips that, are, that we always go through in class, um, like at recess, reptiles marry rabbits to remember the steps of observational learning um, or, you know, other memory tips you might have learned in other subjects, like in health unit three, often you use like bad cats smell dead rats to remember the uh, social model health principles. So all of those memory tips are also an example of elaborative rehearsal because you're not just blindly memorizing those principles or those steps of observational learning. Now you've linked something that will help you to better make meaning of that information or better remember that information. Okay. So Anything that goes the extra mile or goes the extra step and takes you away from just blindly memorizing information to actually try to make meaning of that information is an example of elaborative rehearsal. Okay, and most of you will use elaborative rehearsal because by the time you, um, you get to your age, you're kind of like more cognitively advanced and all that stuff. So you tend to move away from blind memorization of content. Okay, so is everyone happy with elaborative rehearsal? Any yeah question in the chat box at any point of this uh, session. 
Cool, so the main differences between maintenance and elaborative rehearsal, um, those are the main things you need to know. And just come try to come up with one example for maintenance, one example for elaborative. Now, a lot of the time in um, questions or VECA questions, uh, this is pretty obvious. You know, a lot of the time, um, if they've given you a scenario of two people who are learning the same information and they say, okay, Tim um, just repeats the information over and over again to himself, but Kevin looks for real life examples relating to content. Um, who do you think is using maintenance rehearsal in this case? Is it Tim or is it Kevin? You can put your answer in the chat box if you want. Um, Kevin. Mm -hmm. So Tim is repeating the information again and again to himself. What is that an example of? Is that maintenance or elaborative rehearsal? Maintenance. Yeah, that's maintenance. And so because Kevin is then looking for real life examples of the content, that's elaborative because he's going the extra step. Okay. Yeah. Whoever's doing a little bit more to actually remember that information, they will more likely or more often than not be the person using the elaborative rehearsal technique. So it's more effective for him. Yes, exactly. Yeah, it's more effective. Yeah. Okay, so if everyone is good with that, then we'll move on to the next slide. And this is just comparing maintenance and elaborative rehearsal. Um, the similarities is obviously both do help to improve memory, both can lead to encoding or processing information, and both do involve some kind of mental repetition of items. Now, even with elaborative rehearsal, you are still kind of repeating the information again to yourself, but you're doing it in a more informed way. So you're not just blindly memorizing it. In other words, you're memorizing it, but you're memorizing it with all that detail, with all that depth of information. Now, what are the differences? This is what we're more concerned with. The differences are that elaborative rehearsal is a more active form of learning. It's a more active form of rehearsal because remember what I said just now, people who use elaborative rehearsal go the extra mile. They do all the extra steps that they need to do in order to learn the information. Whereas people who use maintenance rehearsal are more passive because they just sit there and blindly try to memorize that information. Okay, just repeating it again and again to themselves. Even they're not sure if they're, it's actually going to get into their head or not. They just have the hope that it will. Um, ER involves meaning. So elaborative rehearsal involves infusing meaning to that information, understanding what does this information actually signify? What does it mean? At the end of the day, what is the point of this information? What is it teaching me? Maintenance rehearsal is obviously no meaning is um, encoded or no meaning is attempted um, to be understood from um, maintenance rehearsal. Elaborative rehearsal involves often linking to other material in long-term memory. So you link new information to information that's already stored. In maintenance rehearsal, there's no linking. So just take that information at face value and try your best to blindly memorize it. And the last thing that we're saying is that elaborative rehearsal almost always transfers to long-term memory because you're putting a lot of attention and a lot of your cognitive resources and a lot of effort into processing and encoding that information. Maintenance rehearsal, although it can go into long-term memory if you blindly memorize enough, most often than not, it will stay in your short-term memory, okay? Because in order to go to long-term memory, there has to be a very high level of encoding. And there's only so much encoding that a person can do by just blindly memorizing information. Okay, so that's basically the comparison of the two. So the last topic we're going through today is called the serial position effect. Now the serial position effect, before we look at the actual definition, um, serial means the order, okay? So whenever we're talking about the word serial, serial means order. You might remember serial recall. Serial recall is when we recall something in a specific order. Um, like if I ask you, okay, what did you do in the morning um, before, you know, tell me everything you did in the morning from when you woke up uh, for Suhoor to when you attended this Zoom session. You would have to start step by up. step, yeah. Yeah, so you'd have to start from when you woke up and go in a specific order, okay? So serial means order. Position means obviously the position or the orientation of a specific object or a specific word. So where is that word located in a specific list or in a specific um, book or something like that. So serial means order, position means the location. So I wanted to define these words before showing you the definition because it's important for you to remember that the serial position effect is all about how does the order or the location of a word on a specific list help you to either have better recall or worse recall of that word on that list. So basically it's the finding that free recall is better for items at the beginning and end of a list than for items in the middle of the list. So let's actually look at a list of words here. 
this is a huge list of words. And if I was to tell you, okay, guys, you've got two minutes to, you know, um, look at this list, word, uh, list of words and uh, commit as many of these words into your memory as possible. And after the two minutes, I'm going to give you a piece of paper and you're going to write down the words. Okay. If we were going to do that task, according to the serial position effect, what we would find is that a lot of you would have really good recall for the last few words because those are the words that are still fresh in your memory after i say okay guys time's up these are the last few words that would still be fresh in your memory words like bounding tightly halting all those words you'd also have pretty good memory of the first few words that you read like exploding swelling drawn out and forceful um, because those were the first few words you read and even before i said okay guys go you already were looking at those words you paid a lot of attention to them the words in the middle are the words that kind of get forgotten about or are the least well recalled or the most poorly recalled because they kind of get lost along the way. And you don't pay a lot of attention to them because you're just focusing on getting to the end and having a look at each and every word. Okay, so a lot of the time we forget the words in the middle. So that's what we mean when we say free recall is better for items at the beginning and end of a list compared to words in the middle of the list, okay? You might kind of um, have um, experienced this when it comes to like oral presentations. A lot of the time you really um, memorize the, or you really um, have a good memory of the first few words of your speech and the last few words of your speech. You know how you're gonna start your speech, you know how you're gonna end your speech, but all that stuff in the middle, which might still be important, is stuff that you might kind of stumble upon and you have to double check your cue cards as you're going through um, because that's the kind of stuff that you forget, okay? And generally, whenever we look at any concept, even if you look at TV ads, the TV ad, or no one watches TV nowadays, I think, but the ads that play, um, you know, at the beginning of the ad break and the end of the ad break are actually gonna be better retained in your memory compared to the ads that play somewhere in the middle. And companies actually pay a, more money to actually make sure their ads are placed either first or last in the ad break, because that's the ad the person sees um, just before they go to get their packet of chips from the cupboard or just before they go for their toilet break or just before the show is about to start back again. Okay, so the serial position effect is relevant to lists of words, but it could be relevant to any example. And a lot of the time in VCA exams or VCA questions, they won't necessarily always ask you about lists of words. They might talk about a person forgetting the first, uh, the forgetting the middle of their speech. And then you might be asked to explain in terms of the serial position effect, why that person forgot the middle of their speech. Okay, so it's not always about list of words, but we're gonna learn about it in terms of a list of words today, because that's the original topic. So obviously if tested on a list of words immediately, so let's say I gave you the two minutes, you guys memorized the words on the list, and then um, I got you to write on the paper, I'm not giving you a delay task. I'm not saying, okay, guys, after the two minutes, I'm going to get you all to go outside and play for 10 minutes and then come back and then we'll do the memory test. Now, I'm saying, okay, straight away, I'm going to test you on this, uh, on your recall of words. So straight away, I give you the paper, you write the words straight away. So without a delay task, when you're tested immediately, like I said before, recall for items at the end of the list will be best because those were the words that were still fresh in your memory and recall will be worst for the words in the middle of the list, okay? The middle of the list words will always be recalled the worst, regardless of whether you're tested immediately or tested with a delay. And I think I had another slide explaining all of this, which I probably should have uh, come to. Okay, so obviously, um, you know, when you're um, asked to study the word list on the left, so this is just cropped out from the bigger word list, let's say that this is your word list here, okay? It's a bit smaller than the previous slide. Um, according to the serial position effect, the primacy effect will have you recalling words like accelerating, fading, fleeting, weak. These are the first few words that you paid attention to. They were the first few words you saw. And so because you paid a lot of attention to them, they got encoded really well and then moved to your long-term memory. Now, with recency effect, because you're recalling words like halting tightly, bounding, these are the words that are in the end of the list, okay? But these are the last few words you're, you had a look at and they're still fresh in your memory because remember your short-term memory has a duration of 30 seconds. So if you've read the word bounding and I give you the piece of paper the next second to start writing the words, the first few words you're gonna write down are bounding tightly and halting because those are the words that are fresh in your memory and you wanna get them out onto the paper before the 30 second duration maxes out or times out. 
Now, if there is a delay, okay, let's say that I say, okay, guys, you can go outside for 10 minutes, play around, and then um, come back to class, and then I'll, we can do the test after that. What's going to happen is the recency effect is going to get eliminated. Because if I go and make you guys uh, go outside for 10 minutes, the 30-second duration of short-term memory will be maxed out, or it will time out, which means that it will no longer hold those last few words. Even if you use maintenance rehearsal to try and maintain those last few words in memory, I mean, how are you going to do that for 10 minutes? Someone's going to distract you or, you know, somehow it's not going to work. So um, a lot of the time in SACS or in exam type questions, they'll say, um, you know, the person was asked to do a mathematical test before, their, um, before doing the word recall test, or the person was asked to um, go watch some TV before they were tested on their recall of the word. So there's some kind of distracting task or delay task that comes in the middle, okay? And that's what we call as recall with a delay. So whenever there's a delay um, that's added or whenever a person is not tested immediately, the recency effect is eliminated. So you can cross out the recency effect and it's the primacy effect that we see. Okay, but if we're tested immediately without a delay, so I give you the paper straight away to write the words, both of these effects will be shown with the recency effect having a bit of a stronger uh, demonstration there. Okay, um, does everyone understand this so far? Miss, so which one is the stronger effect? Um, the stronger effect, if you're tested immediately, will be recency effect. If you're mm -hmm. not tested immediately or if there's a delay or I ask you guys, okay, go outside for 10 minutes and then come back, it will be primacy effect. Okay, so mm -hmm. stronger will depend upon whether there was a delay or whether, there was, or whether you were tested immediately. So whether you're tested immediately or whether there's a delay in the testing. Okay, good. Alrighty, so the next few slides also kind of extend upon this concept. Now, before you panic and like, oh my God, why is there maths in this and all that stuff? Um, this is the serial position effect curve. So this is like, if I was to graph what a curve looks like in terms of the probability or percentage um, of recall, versus the position of the word on the list, you can see that the words at the beginning have a relatively high probability of recall, almost 85%. Um, and the words at the end also have a pretty high recall of almost, what is that, 91%. Um, but the words in the middle have really dropped a lot here. So it's a very poor percentage of recall, like 40, 35% here. Okay, so what this is kind of showing you is that the primacy effect and the recency effect are always better or always more strongly shown than the words in the middle, okay? The words in the middle are not recalled well, and because of that, they tend to be forgotten, and that's what explains the low probability of recall. So 0 0.4 here is like 40%, okay? Now, primacy effect is shown in both immediate and delayed recall. So regardless of whether I get you guys to write the word straight away, or I tell you guys go outside for 10 minutes and then come back, you will still show the primacy effect. That won't suddenly disappear. What will disappear is the recency effect if I delay the recall. So if I say, okay, guys, go outside for 10 minutes and then come back, the um, recency effect will be eliminated. So recency effect is only apparent for immediate recall. That's why we write here, immediate recall only. Now, you're not required to memorize this graph or memorize where each of the dots are, but I want you to remember the general shape of this graph, okay? And the general shape of this graph tends to resemble, for those of you who do... Um, What's it called? Per? For those of you who do um, like maths-based subjects, it kind of tends to resemble the shape of a parabola. So it's kind of like almost like a U shape, okay? Where you've got better recall for the words in the first few positions and last few positions, but a dip in the middle, okay? So just re remember the serial position effect curve resembles um, the shape of a parabola or kind of a U shape. You might be asked to identify it in a multiple choice, but you would never be asked to draw it like word to word or point to point like that. Okay, so I know this topic isn't super easy, so that's why I put these slides and I, I don't know why I chose this font. I just thought it would make things easier to understand, but that's so stupid. Um, so anyway, this just explains everything that we kind of just went through. So immediate recall, if a person is tested immediately without any delay or without any distractor task on their recall of words from a list, what we see is words from the middle of the list are not recalled well. This is always the case. So we'll obviously cover that one first. We all know that. We all know words from the middle of the list will not be recalled well in any case. Now we're more interested to see which words are recalled best. So if we're tested immediately, we recall words from the end of the list best. 
why do we show the recency effect? Or why is the recency effect the strongest when we're tested immediately? It's because these are the words that we've just recently read, okay? Recency and recently kind of sound the same, so you can remember it like that. And because we're tested immediately on these words that we've just recently looked at on the paper, or we've just recently read, these words are still fresh in our memory and they will remain fresh in our memory for up to 30 seconds, which gives us enough time to write them on the paper. The primacy effect is also there, but the primacy effect is second best because although we paid a lot of attention to these words in the beginning, and although they did move from short-term memory to long-term memory, um, they're not the words we most recently encountered in the list. And for that reason, uh, recency effect actually takes over the primacy effect in this case. Okay, both are still apparent, but recency effect is best when a person is tested immediately on immediate recall. If a person is tested with a delayed recall, so if a person is tested basically um, with a delay task or a oops, sorry, delay task or a distractor task, what that means is the recency effect will no longer be there. So the recency eff effect, in other words, will be eliminated. Why? Because if I give you guys a delay, or I say, okay, do this test for 10 minutes or go outside and play for 10 minutes and then we'll test your recall, those 10 minutes are going to be longer than 30 seconds. And 30 seconds is the maximum duration of your short-term memory. So obviously, whatever words were fresh in your memory um, will no longer be fresh. They'll just disappear from your short-term memory. Or in other words, they'll be displaced, which means they fall out of your long-term, I'm sorry, they fall out of your short-term memory. Um, so recency effect, when there is delayed recall, if a person is asked to do a delayed task or distract a task, or in other words, if a person is asked to not recall the words immediately, there'll be no recency effect. Recency effect will be eliminated the words from the middle of the list, like I said before, continue to not be recalled well. They are always recalled poorly, the words in the middle of the list. But the primacy effect starts to take its place, okay? So the primacy effect is when we tend to recall words from the beginning of the list best because we did pay a lot of attention to them. And so these move through long-term memory. Remember, when long -term, whenever something moves into long-term memory, it's kind of a more safer place. It's kind of a safe and more guaranteed place where a person is not going to be likely to forget those words, okay? And it's more reliable in terms of its storage of those words. So in simple terms, if you're tested with immediate recall, recency effect is best, but the primacy effect is still there. If you're tested with delayed recall, which means that um, rather than test, being tested straight away, you're asked to do a delayed task or something like that or distracted by doing something else, the recency effect will be eliminated, it will no longer be apparent, and the primacy effect will be apparent. Okay, so that's basically um, the difference between the two. So that's basically all we're covering for today. I know that was a lot of content, but um, at least we're done with it for this week. So you can kind of get on with the rest of the questions um, and kind of get on with creating your summary notes. For well, before all of you go, um, I'll just kind of recap what you need to be doing for this week. So. Basically, what you need to be doing is you need to be um, completing the following learning activities. Okay, so you need to be completing um, seven point, it really depends on which book you have as well. So obviously, when we're looking at um, when we're looking at the old book, you were doing 7.16, 7.17, 7.19. So whether you have the old book or the new book, those are the specific um, learning activities and the questions that you're gonna have to do. Now, obviously we usually say give it in by Friday, but um, essentially as long as it's in by Sunday night, then um, yeah, it's all good. Um, okay, so tomorrow we'll have another Zoom session doing the practice questions. So if possible, it'd be really good for you guys to revise this content now so you can get the most out of tomorrow's practice uh, question session that we'll have. Um, but yeah, that's about it for today. So if you want to head over to the class page, I will stop the recording here.